Now we will take a public testimony, so if anyone would like to come to the table and share some thoughts. Hi, my name is Angie Weaver. Um, you may also have seen my daughter Amelia and my husband Josh, but she's had a long day, so she had to run out. They may run back in though. Um, we also have a three-year-old Penelope who's at home with Grandma. Oh, there they come. <laughs> I'd like to tell you briefly about my daughter Amelia. Um, Amelia was born a beautiful, healthy baby girl. The first two and a half years of her life were like a dream come true. She was walking, talking, feeding herself, singing her ABCs, counting to 20. We thought she was like the smartest kid in the world, like most parents. Um, when she was two and a half, we found her one morning having a seizure in her crib. We don't know how long she'd been seizing for. It's the scariest moment of my life, um, watching my baby have a seizure. By the time we got her to the hospital, she had four more before they sedated her. I can't describe how helpless it is to watch your child suffer and to not be able to do anything to stop it. Amelia has tried 23 anticonvulsants. She has failed every one of them. In her short life, she's had well over a thousand seizures. She has side effects from these anticonvulsants, brittle bones, and when she breaks a bone, it's serious and requires surgeries, um, liver damage. Some of the side effects we're currently dealing with, because getting into the list of all the others would be take forever, um, sleeplessness, excitability, nausea, vomiting. Um, my husband and I joked, wouldn't it be great if something could help with nausea from all these seizure meds? <laughs> um, Amelia has been diagnosed with Gervais syndrome. It's a rare catastrophic form of epilepsy. It's hard to treat. There's few treatment options. We've already failed 23 meds in the special diet. The kind of people that my husband and I are are those that refuse to believe that this is going to be our daughter's life. When we got this diagnosis, we immediately started researching what are other parents of kids with Gervais syndrome doing because I bet they're just not watching their kids suffer and pass away. We came across um, a video of a little girl named Charlotte Figgy and we watched her with our daughter's same diagnosis take a dropper full of medical cannabis and Charlotte, who was having more seizures than her daughter, almost 300 a day or week, um, she started walking and talking again and having seizure control and quality of life. When I watched this video, I said to my husband, we have to get this for Amelia. She needs this. Since age four, Amelia's lost the ability to speak. She's regressed developmentally, is now globally delayed. She needs help in all aspects of her life, all of her self-care. I stay home to take care of her full time. She has 30 to 50 seizures a day. While she's able to walk, she has to be strapped into a chair or hold, held by my husband and I at all times because otherwise she risks falling over and breaking bones, risking serious injury. I can't tell you what it meant to me to call my mom and tell her that we got to stay in Minnesota that we don't have to move away from our family. And my three-year-old, Amelia's sister, gets to stay with her Nana and Papa and grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins. This is gonna help my daughter, Amelia, and children with epilepsy and thousands of people in Minnesota. We're so grateful for everyone that's been involved in making this happen for us. This is gonna change our daughter's life, and it's a very important first step for Minnesota. I thank everyone involved that has made this happen because it has not been an easy process. We have been at this. We've given our, our lives. Have, we have given our time. We've driven the eight hours round trip to the Capitol more times than I can count. This is important. I don't want my daughter to be one of the children that passes away while we're waiting for a medical marijuana law. A million needs and deserves this, as do all the people suffering in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Weaver. Um, and let me thank you publicly um, for all of your time and efforts. Um, and Representative Elaine said some of the families have been here more than we have this year. So um, it's hard work, um, but it takes citizen engagement. So we appreciate that so much. Uh, questions, members? All right, thank you so much. Um, I found my list of uh, Christy Polly.
Hello, committee, many, committee, hello, sorry. committee members. My name is Christy Pauling. Along with me is my husband, Jeremy, and my daughter, Caitlin. Caitlin is seven years old. Her sisters, Kaylee, 12, and Cassie, 10, could not be here today. Caitlin has Batten's disease with intractable epilepsy. She started out as a healthy little girl. She was my climber. She was into everything. Um, couldn't keep her off the top of the table. Um, at three years of age, um, her seizures kept coming and coming. We tried lots of medications. Nothing seemed to help. Um, the medications that she was taking um, had warnings, and she still takes them, warnings of liver damage, kidney damage, and loss of eyesight, and they were FDA approved. We feel medical cannabis would be a safer option for her. Um, she was regressing and losing all of her milestones that she had mastered. We sought out specialist after specialist to figure out what was happening. Um, she had a stem cell transplant with little improvement. At five years of age, we finally got diagnosed with Batten's disease. Nothing a parent ever wants to hear. It is a terminal disease, and she is expected to live to 10 to 12 years of age. She cannot walk, she cannot talk, and cannot eat only through her G-tube. She is wheelchair-bound. Her days continue to get worse with seizures, movements, and loss of eyesight. Nothing is working. There is no cure for her disease. The hardest part of this is telling her older sisters that she is going to die. We are hoping that with medical cannabis, we can give her a better quality of life for the years that she has left and maybe prolong her life so a cure can be found. We are out of options, and the only thing left is hope. We appreciate you working hard to get a workable bill that hopefully the governor will agree with. We know it was hard for a lot of you to make the decisions that you have. This is a stepping stone in the right direction to figure out what others need. We know medical cannabis is working for other children in other states to help reduce their seizures and give them a better quality of life. With this bill, we can stay in the state we love and be with our support system. Caitlin can be with her sisters and our family can stay as one. Thanks for taking time to listen to my testimony and giving us hope for the future. Yes, um, my name is Jeremy Paulin. Thank you, committee members, for having me here today. I was uh, asked to stop talk on behalf of uh, Maria Botica and Mark Botica from Clinton. Uh, Martha was going to be here today, but she had to run to another meeting. Um, uh, here we go. Um, I'm here to testify today about uh, a little girl named Greta, seven years old. Um, Maria and Greta have been living in Colorado legally to access Charlotte's Web the safe legal liquid form of medical cannabis that Greta takes mixed with her food three times a day. This medical cannabis has been such a miracle for Greta, but since it's not legal in the state of Minnesota, so their family had to make the tough decision of move Greta and Maria to Colorado while Greta's father Mark, father Mark and two, year old, two older sisters, Emma and Laura, ages 13 and 10, continue to live at home on their farm in Clinton, Minnesota. Greta started seizing at five mon months of age. She was diagnosed with infantile spasms at seven months, and her condition has further deteriorated into lennox gasto syndrome, which is a severe form of epilepsy in which Greta has to endure multiple types of seizures each day and also have severe development delay. Mark and Maria have done everything they possibly can to help control Greta's epilepsy over the last seven years. To date, Greta has failed over 15 different epilepsy medications, too strict, specialized diets, and even brain surgery. This past summer, after much research and prayer, Mark and Maria, Emma, and Laura decided that moving part of their family to Colorado was necessary to give Greta her greatest shot at seizure freedom. Greta's longtime epilepsy physician from St. Paul even supported them, going to Colorado as he knew that Greta had run out of options to treat her epilepsy. So they went to Colorado, purchased a home there, went through the rigorous process of getting Greta approved for, me for medical cannabis, and finally were able to start Charlotte's Web on November 12, 2013. Since starting the medical cannabis, Greta has enjoyed a nearly 80% decrease in her seizure activity and has been able to get off four of her five pharmaceutical medications she was taking. And most, most importantly, she started doing things she has never done before, such as being able to hold a spoon and bring it to her mouth. Maria, so, Maria also just recently noticed how she really enjoys looking around at the world when they are outside in a stroller or for a drive. In the past, Greta would just keep her head down and not really engage in the environment around her at all. 
but now a school bus drives by when you're out for a stroll ride it has Greta pointing and smiling. We're all really excited that Greta recently started giving kisses again. <coughs> Maria is sure that it has been well over four years since Greta used to give her all kisses this way. Those daily seizures are just so devastating to Greta's overall growth, development, safety and health and happiness and now medical cannabis is helping control them and therefore allowing Greta to, to learn again. This is just a part of the reason that Mark and Maria and their family have been determined to get help get, help get cannabis legalized in Minnesota. There are, are so many children and adults that can benefit from the plant and all of its components. The medical cannabis that Greta is taking in Colorado does not and would never give anyone a high because of the extremely low amount of THC in the cannabis she takes. It's safer than any of the prescription medications she has been on over seven years, but they can't legally bring it home or even bring Greta home for a short visit. The best medical treatment for Greta has ever had and it's illegal in our state. Now that Mark and Maria have seen the impressive medical cannabis results with Greta, all their family really wants to do is be together again. Living in Clinton with the ability to treat Greta with medical cannabis here in Minnesota. And they want for all families that are in the similar situation. Greta absolutely adores being with her family, especially her sisters. And this is something that she has been only with them for 20 days out of the last 184 days. And has been from home. Maria and Greta are not separated. Maria and Greta are not only separated from Mark, Emma, and Laura, but also away from grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and lots of friends back in the community. Please help bring Greta and Maria back home by legalizing medical cannabis in Minnesota this session. We just want them home soon and for Greta to be able to have access to a quality form of cannabis in Minnesota as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your time you have put into working on this issue. We need something functional past this session. And Mark and Maria and our entire family are grateful for your wisdom perseverance and mostly your compassion. Thanks again. Thank Any you. questions? Thank you, Mr. Pauling. Please, uh, tell the doctors, uh, uh, give, bring them our greetings and, and, uh, and um, like the weavers and yourselves, um, I echo again the thanks for um, your incredible diligence and stamina on behalf of yourselves, but of course on behalf of many, many, many and we appreciate you guys sitting out and listening to what we had to say. I don't know how many people we've talked to the House and Senate, and, and they didn't know where they were at. And just listening to us and becoming educated by what we had known. We, we probably learned more about this in the past year and a half than, than a lot of people. So we appreciate that also. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Cassie Tron. I'm 24 years old and I've had severe refractory Crohn's disease for the past eight years. In the first three years of my illness, I failed nearly all conventional treatments, three of which carry FDA black box warnings and one that actually requires patients enroll in a federal monitoring program because the side effects are so severe. In the five years since, not one new medication has been approved by the FDA for Crohn's disease. Five years ago, during a flare that left me unable to keep down solid foods for 18 days, I tried cannabis and could finally eat again. I continued to use cannabis daily, and I'm now very pleased to say I've been in remission for five years. I take zero pharmaceuticals for Crohn's disease. My doctor is fully supportive of my current treatment plan, which includes vaporizing plant material. Whole plant cannabis treats my disease, not just my symptoms. I'm completely unsure whether or not using solely oils will keep me in remission like whole plant does. So my choices now are to use a form of cannabis that may or may not work, or to remain a criminal to access the type of cannabis that I know works for me. High potency oil can be extremely intoxicating. 
This defeats the purpose of self-titration and can render patients completely incapacitated. Finally, something I find particularly vexing about the exclusion of whole plant is that the conversation around this issue has included the desire to get out of the way of patients and doctors in order to, for them to make the best medical decisions together. While I look forward to other patients being able to discuss the benefits of medical cannabis with their doctors, and I sincerely hope they find relief, I want to be clear that by forcing me to use a high-potency oil, this bill is actually wedging itself in between my doctor and I and the treatment plan that I am currently using and he approves of. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Trong. Um, we, did, we did include um, what we call whole plant extracts, and that does not uh, require, um, it's not required to be a, a high potency oil. Does that leave you any options uh, better than just high potency oils? I actually need quite a bit of THC. That's what's been keeping me in remission. Um, and so I would need these high potency oils, which again are extremely intoxicating. Um, I have passed out from using them currently, so that, I mean, again, not as serious side effects as we've seen, but passing out isn't exactly, isn't exactly a functional way to use medicine. Okay, questions, members? Right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony, it's important for us to hear. Um, Ms. Whitey, from Whitey. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. In 2009, I came before, um, started coming before committees and ta talking about my daughter that died of melanoma skin cancer. Just like, you just introduce yourself quickly. My name is Joni Whiting, and I'm from Jordan, Minnesota. In 2009, I was asked by my uh, legislative um, house representative to come before committees and to tell them the story of my daughter, and I did that. My daughter illegally used uh, cannabis in the last 89 days of her life. And some of you, I think most of you, uh, I have sat and testified in front of. I am neutral on this bill. I am so glad that there is going to be a bill passed that helps these children that you see here. But. I also know of a little boy that I talked to his mother, who is in this group of parents, whose little boy doesn't qualify under this bill because he has mitochondrial disease. His mother came down here this whole session, and she kept telling the sitter, or telling her little boy, it's okay, it's okay, mommy's gonna go get the medicine to make your throw-ups stop because he has severe nausea and he can't swallow water, food, or his medicine. And when I leave here, I'm going to have to go back and call her and tell her that she's not included and that her son is not included on this. He doesn't have any of the things that help him to get the medicine. So I would ask first of all, that you reconsider because there are two children in this same group of people that have been coming down here and hoping and praying that that five-year-old little, five little boy is helped by this oil and that his mommy did get him the medicine to make his throbs go away. The only the thing I have to say is that my daughter has already passed away and I have no personal um, like agenda here other than to tell what happened to my daughter. But as a mother, and I've done extensive research since she's passed, and I can tell you that if I had a choice between continuing to have my daughter illegally smoke one to two puffs of plant material marijuana locked in a small bathroom in our house and be able to come out and eat is more preferable even with the legal ramifications 
than what my daughter would get from this bill from you. In other words, I would tell my daughter to continue to illegally use marijuana rather than get on this program. And that is only because, as a mother, and I have researched this, I do believe that the, when you take the plant and you alter it and you um, take a, I think it's a pound of marijuana makes two ounces of extract, you're taking someone that could have used one to two tiny puffs of plant material a pinch, and now you've subjected them into 10 to 16 times more than they needed of psychoactive THC material. And I would be worried about that. I'm very, very concerned about that. So I thank you for having me here. And God bless you all for everything that you've done, and especially you that changed your mind and are helping people and these moms. But I'll be back to see you guys again until it's done all the way. Thank you so much for beginning this, this, but it wouldn't have helped us. And my daughter was a cancer patient, and she is listed on that bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. White. Any questions for Ms. White? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very yeah, much. Appreciate it. Uh, all of your abilities as well. Thank you. Uh, Kim Kelsey. Hi, my name is Kim Kelsey, and I'm from Excelsior, Minnesota. I um, typically dress a little bit more capitalish. <laughs> uh, but today we were at a very cool thing. Um, we had a press conference with Coach Jerry Kill from the Gophers um, for Epilepsy Awareness Day in Minnesota. So we were at Kieran's and then we were all going to the Twins game and then I got the call. They went to the Twins game, I came here. So um, I don't have my, I have it a little bit on my phone. If you allow me to share Alex's story, or if all of you have heard it before, I could not say it too, but I just think it's important, if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay. Um, and it's much smaller on my phone than it was on the iPad. <laughs> okay. I live in Excelsior with my husband, Mark, and daughter, Morgan, and son, Alec. We are in total support of medical cannabis for Alec and also the thousands of Minnesotans with intractable epilepsy and other ailments. Intractable um, seizures is when multiple drugs have been tried and failed to control somebody's seizures. It was the morning of Mother's Day, May 12, 1996, which was just 18 years ago, that we woke to find Alec in his bed, unconscious, barely clinging to life. EMTs performed CPR, intubated him in our kitchen, and he was airlifted to the hospital, where he spent 18 days in a coma and the next six months in the hospital. Assuming that Alec would live and wake from the coma, he was rated at best to be in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. Well, Alec did wake up from the coma, and he went on to defy all of the odds, which he continues to do daily. He had to relearn all of the basic things like eating, talking, walking, etc. We got him back, and that was our miracle number one. The formal diagnosis was encephalitis. It was a high fever that caused him to have a seizure in the middle of the night and aspirated, leaving him deprived of oxygen for an unknown period of time. The result was bilateral brain damage, which led to what has now been an 18-year battle with daily life-threatening seizures. Initially, we were told that it could take up to two years to find the right medication. 18 years and 24 anticonvulsants later, Alex's seizures remain uncontrolled. Today, a combination of five drugs and 32 pills a day don't stop the hundreds of seizures that he has daily. To put it into more perspective, a leading Minnesota neurologist recently told us that for any patient that is exhausted as many meds as Alex and remains uncontrolled, the likelihood of a new pharmaceutical working is less than 
Alex's seizures are life-threatening, so my husband and I are with him 24-7. And when I say 24-7, I mean 24-7. He is 6 feet 2 inches tall, 175 pounds, that is physically capable, but cannot be left alone. My husband sleeps with him, must be in the shower with him, and is under our supervision at all times. We carry an emergency medication called diastat, which must be delivered rectally to stop a seizure that could take his life at any given moment. Imagine me being in the aisle at Target, trying to administer this medication to a life and death situation, and I've done it. <coughs> He's considered high risk for SUDEP, which is sudden unexplained death and epilepsy. This puts him at risk of death even when he is not seizing. He's been around the country for, we have been around the country for every conceivable test to determine if there was a surgical condition, but this was ruled out. That is the negative side of the story, but Alec won't let us look at it like that. People ask us all the time, how do you cope with it all? And our response is Alec is the one walking around, playing sports, what have you, not knowing when he might have a seizure, and it does, if it doesn't bother him, what right do we have to complain? We can only make things better. He has shown us what it means to be, to persevere. From the beginning, we, he, um, bleh, sorry, not only did he not complain, he found a way to make the best of it. He was the winning kid at age nine for the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota and throwing out the first pitch at a Twins game. He was born an athlete and has ferociously complained a pen competitive spirit. This is how he beat the odds then and, and why he lives for sports now. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Today he competes with our Special Olympics delegation, the West Metro Warriors, that we started for him in 2007 to ensure he would have a competitive outlet. He is a leader in our delegation that has grown to support more than 75 athletes and families. Um, he also does Global Messenger for Special Olympics and is very involved in doing speeches. Not on a little iPhone, be like me. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it flipped. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, when Alec was little, he would have a seizure on the ice during a hockey game and my husband would carry him off the ice to a bench. First thing out of Alec's mouth when he regained consciousness was, Dad, don't let me miss my shift. This happens more often than not. He refuses to give up. He will fight, fight, fight when most people would sleep for anywhere from three to 24 hours after a tonic-clonic seizure. He's up and at him trying to get his legs back so he can get back in the game and finish it. Um, I'm kind of skipping ahead because you guys have all been here a long time. And Oh, I got to the thank you page. Um, and so I'll just expand on that. So I want to thank you guys so much for all your hard work. I can't believe that the hours that we've been here and all the people that we've met and, and the big hearts, even though this is politics and everyone that I know was like, why are you getting involved? You can't fight City Hall. You can't this. But you know what? We found out that we can and that you guys truly, truly care about all patients. And I truly believe that with what happened today is the first step in the right direction. I mean, I'm so speechless, which all of you in here know I'm not very speechless about anything, but I'm so excited that so many people will have access to try this, and it's all the hope that a lot of us have. But I just look forward to seeing the rest of Minnesota patients being able to have access to this, and particularly the, the one that I guess, the people that are suffering that may not be considered terminal. I don't know if terminal means four weeks or what exactly the interpretation of terminal is, but if there's a way to get it to those patients before they become terminal. So I just, I just thank you, and I, I look forward to seeing you again, and I truly, if this works for Alec and the rest of the patients that are included in this bill, we'll all be back here together as a group to say miracle number two. So thank you.
Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Kelsey, and thank you for ringing out by a few days ago. And to meet him outside the chambers. That was great. He's a, he's a great guy. He keeps wondering why I keep going to um, Capitol to see Bill. Bill is our pharmacist. So I'll say, well, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to work on the bill. He's like, I don't get it. Every time we go see Bill, he just gives us their medicine. <laughs> so i got to find somebody named Bill in the Capitol. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? And the twins won, I heard. All right. Mary Beth Davis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't usually get nervous, but when I spell my son, I do. I'm here as a mom, Harry Beth Davidson, and uh, thank you so much. Um, I have a son who um, he's 27 and has about a thousand seizures a day, and um, I was talking to the commissioner about and I should stop right, but um, there is a little issue here in the bill um, under. Um, it's um, on page eight, subdivision four, um, registered designated caregiver. Normally, um, I wouldn't be testifying on this bill, but you know, as a mom who has the potential of maybe using um, this um, this new therapy, I'm really excited. My son has uh, lennox gastel syndrome. It's um, a rare seizure disorder with intractable seizures, about a thousand seizures a day. Lives in a group home um, who, with another child who has the same diagnosis. The program manager from the home is um, was a lab tech at Mayo. She's very good with his meds, very good with um, seizures, and um, this would prohibit her from treating two children in the same or two clients in the same group home. Um, and I don't know how you'd get around that um, if there's two two people with lennox gastel syndrome. They both have intractable seizures. Both parents want to try this therapy. Um, we we could run into problems. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, sorry to get emotional. Um, doing this for Mike's dad too, Tony Mancuso, who's written articles and was really interested in trying this therapy. Thank you. Thank you. So just to put it on the record that um, it could be a problem because sometimes they combine these kids into one group home and I take them out of the group home every other weekend and. Um, would then be, I suppose, that caregiver as well that would be responsible for this. Right now, we have to sign off for the five meds that he's on. And just FYI, is um, he takes lactulose four times a day um, to draw the ammonia out of his liver because the, the other drugs are killing his liver. So we're really, um, I'm excited about trying this. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from Ms. Davis? We do, we do contemplate, um, I mean, one patient can have, or one, uh, you know, one patient can have one, more than one caregiver, but the reverse is not the case, so I don't know. We talked a little bit about this after the uh, fix the other issue around caregiver numbers, is, well, we'll get into that in just a second. to think about this subject for a minute then uh, Representative Hamilton. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say she brings up an excellent point like many people have, and I was wondering if we could do you know, some type of oral to address that. Yes, um, but, but first, before we, we maybe, I have another point <coughs> too that I wanted to run past the uh, committee and has to do the caregiver issue as well. But, um, so why don't we let Ms. Kavanagh think about it, and um, why don't I call for more um, public testimony. Would anyone else like to testify? Ms. Kelsey wants to say something. She, she didn't finish I her I know. <laughs> Shocker. It's Kim Kelsey again. Um, that, that brought up an interesting fact, and I'm not sure because I haven't read exactly what it says, but with the, with the caregiver situation like, like ours, we, her, theirs is different because of group home, and it makes total sense because a few of Alex's friends are in group homes. Um, in our case, it's we, we don't have a nurse or anybody. It's my husband or myself. And so if... You can both act. There's we can no, both no, act. There's no prohibition on one person having more than one caregiver. Is there an age? The issue we're trying to address is one caregiver having more than one 
Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. You have to ask them if there's an age because remember before they added the for minor to not minor. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, you're cool. All right, I'll take you some more. Thank you, Mr. Cecilia. Mr. Chair. Representative Senator Clark. Um, I, so I keep hearing you say that they can have, that a, uh, an individual patient could have multiple designated caregivers, and that's not how I read this either on line 830 and 31, the commissioner shall register a single designated caregiver under certain circumstances, and I see that as a limitation on the number of caregivers for an individual patient, but unless I'm right? missing something. Are you looking for uh, Line 8.30 and 8.31. Okay, thank you. Uh, line 所以，我们不是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我们是说，我